Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I'd like to welcome you to the European Parliament. I'd like to welcome you to a meeting room that is usually used by the Liberals, the ALDE group, the Alliance of Liberals and Democrats for Europe. And together with my colleague, Mr. Skilakakis, I'd like to welcome you to this seminar. And this seminar is entitled Preserving the Knowledge of the Mother Tongue Abroad, Perspectives and Challenges. And it's a great pleasure uh, for me to say that there are different groups represented. There's a visitors group from Crete, from La Sithi, a, a theater group and a group of teachers from Germany, from Cologne and Dusseldorf. And it's a great pleasure for me to welcome many officials from the EU institutions, more specifically the Commission, and to welcome many journalists here, as well as um, colleagues and all the guest speakers up here at the top table. Before I introduce our speakers, I'm going to give the floor to my colleague, Mr. Skilakakis. I think that he's running a temperature and he was the coordinator for a three-hour meeting in this very room that took place right before this seminar. And I think it, it would be a good idea to give him the floor before I give the floor to Jonathan Hill and before I introduce the other speakers on the panel. So, Thodor, thank you very much for co-organizing this and you have the floor. Nice. Thank you very much. I apologize from the outset because I'm going to have to leave. I don't want to uh, get anyone else on the panel ill and I want to pass on my germs. And I'd like to thank Jorgo for his idea of organizing this and for taking the initiative to put it together. And I'm going to start off by telling you a story I'm not a Greek who has grown up abroad. I'm a Greek who has lived his whole life in Greece. But I do have a lot of experience uh, of meeting Greeks who have lived abroad. Uh, my uh, brother-in-law and his wife, who recently emigrated to the States, and my nephews, they have been... Um, battling with both the Greek language and the English language. And I've um, had the chance to see what they've been doing. My nephews are nine and 12, and I've had the opportunity to see how they've learned the Greek language. And of course, you know, I've had this concern about whether my nephews will become or remain Greeks or become and remain Americans and to what extent these things can be combined. So over the last five to six years, I've uh, really witnessed this um, learning experience, if you like. And I've uh, realized that learning their parents' language is of vital importance uh, when it comes to their relationship with Greece. And what is even more important is for them to learn how to write in Greek. It's extremely important for them to learn how to read and write in Greek, which is the language of their parents. and uh, the extent to which one can have access to a Greek school is of crucial importance. My nephews were lucky enough to have a grandmother who was Greek and who was a teacher. And for those five years, she would go to the States and stay for three month periods and teach the children Greek. I'm mentioning this so that you can really grasp to what extent Greeks invest in preserving their language. 
I do really believe that they have learned very good Greek and I hope that they will improve their command of Greek uh, in the future. But it's not just about emotions and identity. I think that there's a second dimension here. The fact that they have learned Greek, that they can speak and read and write in Greek, is extremely important for them when it comes to them developing as an individual. Uh, Greek is one of the two classical languages of the Western world. Modern Greek, of course, is the direct continuation of ancient Greek and it's you can look towards the past and look uh, at ancient Greek and find how modern Greek is the direct continuation of ancient Greek. And I think that when it comes to my nephew's future, uh, their knowledge of Greek will be very important. There are a lot of educated people around the world who would love to speak Greek. Uh, there are many people who would uh, love to be in their position. And I think that it's a great asset. It's a great software almost, if I may put it that way, if I can use a very modern word. And this helps them look at the world from a different point of view as well. And the efforts that Greeks abroad are um, doing in order to keep their language alive is very important, despite the very difficult situation that Greece finds itself and despite the huge difficulties we're up against. I think that Greece has to invest both uh, morally, politically, and economically in this and support these efforts as much as possible. And once again, I apologize for having to leave early. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming. And I'd like to say that we're going to be speaking to Mrs. Arvanitis in Patras via Skype. Each speaker will have five to six minutes, and then after all the presentations, we'll have a discussion and we'll have a Q&A session. I'd like to say that what we need to focus on this evening is how we can make sure that uh, the teaching of Greek uh, remains at a very high level despite the crisis. There are less resources available, it's true, but there is still a need to continue um, passing on this great heritage to uh, the children abroad. And we have, we'll have to come up with novel solutions I know that a parent in Cologne, Paris, or Dusseldorf wants there to be high-level teaching, high-level education, but these parents might be reluctant to pay this money or send this money to Greece, but they would, be, but they would gladly pay that money to a school or an institute if there were transparency. I'm going to be very frank about this. So we'll be discussing uh, the problems, but we'll also be looking at solutions. Well, now we will have the first presentation in English. There is interpretation available. If you want to listen to English, then you can tune into channel two. So just press two on your channel button. And if you want to listen to Greek, it's seven. Jonathan Hill from the European Commission uh, Jonathan Hill has worked in the European Union Affairs in Brussels since 1995, and he is, so to say, the right hand of Commissioner Vassiliou. Andrula Vassiliou is the Commissioner of the European Union for Cultural Affairs and also responsible for multilingualism. And Jonathan himself is in the cabinet of uh, Mrs. Vassiliou, the person responsible for this multilingualism. Jonathan is British. And um, Britain, as um, maybe uh, the place where uh, the world's most spoken language, not most spoken, but our uh, language we use in, in order to talk to each other is used, 
nearly 20% of the English language stem directly from Greek. And that's a lot. And that shows how important this language is. There's only one other language in the world that for nearly 4,000 years, and they haven't that much of experience in their language, uh, that have kept their language and also their alphabet for that time. They don't have an alphabet, but they have uh, signs. That's Chinese. So only Greek and Chinese play in the same Champions League of languages. And that is why uh, to preserve uh, the possibilities to learn Greek language all over the place, all over the world, and especially in Europe, is very important. Jonathan, I would like to pass on the floor to you. Yorgo, thanks very much. Um, I'm very touched by your invitation. Um, and I'm very honored to be with all of you tonight. And um, I have to say I'm slightly intimidated by the group because uh, just looking through some of the names, um, there are a, a large number of people in this room who know a lot more than I do about languages and who know a lot more about education than I do. Um, but what I'm going to try to do to try and give you something useful over the next 10 minutes, let's say, is, is really three things. First of all, I want to say very clearly how committed the European Commission is to languages, how committed the European Union is to languages and language learning and linguistic diversity. In the second part, I want to say a few words um, about the importance of mother tongue. Why, why is it so important and already um, already Theodoros touched on, on some of those reasons. And then in the third and final part, I want to give you something of perhaps a little bit more practical value and talk a little bit about what the EU does in the field of languages, what sort of programs we have, um, how we spend money. And I'm hoping that that will give you a few ideas in the room about how you and your organizations can get involved in some of these programs and help us to take the issue of mother tongue languages forward. First of all, um, like Theodorus, I will also start with a short story. Um, Commissioner Vassiliou um, sadly can't be with us. Um, year ago, I don't need to explain to you what the life of a politician is like. Um, you are constantly on the road. And once again, uh, my commissioner, Mrs. Vassiliou, is traveling. So she apologizes. She would have loved uh, to have been here with you tonight. But one little story about her and her commitment to languages. And I know that this is a, a true story because I was there in the room when it happened. A very simple story. But um, around August, September of last year, the European Commission was preparing the text of its next education program, Erasmus for All, um, which I'll talk about a, a little later. So Erasmus for All. The, the European Union's new education program, which the European Parliament and the Council um, is now negotiating. And uh, Mrs. Vassiliou received the first draft of the text after the summer holidays, so this was the beginning of September. And she looked through it and she said, okay, I'm, I'm reasonably happy, it's going in the right direction, but there's one problem above all, and that is we have to put languages higher up in this program. Languages have to be more visible in this program. And the end result of all of this, and, and we feel very proud about this because we, we think we've done the right thing, is that Erasmus for All, the European Union's program for education and training, will have six objectives. One of those objectives will be language learning and linguistic diversity. So I think that's fantastic news. I think it's great for languages. Um, and that will mean a lot of of resources going into the field of language learning. But I, I tell you that story to, to tell you how much Commissioner Vassiliou um, is committed to this, this question. Um, congratulations to Yorgo on the timing of this event. Um, there are four or five reasons where I think, why I think the timing is, is absolutely perfect. First of all, um, we could be seeing history tonight as Apuel of Nicosia um, tried to reach the quarterfinals of the Champions League. Um, so, great, uh, great choice of day, Yorgo. Uh, the half of our cabinet is anxiously watching the, the television tonight. Um, but more seriously, I, I think it's safe to say that, that languages have never been as 
deeply embedded in the constitution of the European Union as they are today. If you look at the treaty of the European Union, if you look at the Charter of Fundamental Rights, languages are there and they're, very, they're there very strongly. And they are a fundamental right. They have become a fundamental right, as they should be. Secondly, as I was just saying, if you look at the European Union's next programme for education and training, Erasmus for All, which will come into force in, in 2014, languages are at the heart of it. So, as we say in English, very idiomatically, um, the European Union is putting its money where its mouth is and doing the right thing, I think. Looking to the near future, and in fact this spring, spring of this year, we will be publishing a, a very large Eurobarometer survey on European citizens' attitudes to languages. And I think that will give us all some really interesting information about how Europeans across the EU feel about languages and also about what they're doing to, to learn them and whether they really are learning them. Um, let me say now a few words about, about mother tongue. This is why we're all here. And why, why is it so important? Theodorus mentioned two or three times, just by talking about his family, the question of identity. And I think this really gets to the heart of it. It's about identity, personal identity, family identity, community and national identity. So it's extremely important. And I think we all instinctively understand the relationship between language and identity. It's very difficult to define the mother tongue. Um, if you look very quickly in the research on this, there is no single, clear, absolute definition of the mother tongue. And there seems to be a more objective approach to defining it and a more subjective approach to defining it. And if, if we listen to what Theodorus was saying and the importance of language to his family, and to their relationship to Greek culture and Greek tradition, then, then we're, we're talking about something which is quite subjective. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. Secondly, there's the question of how we interrelate amongst ourselves. Let's say how we interact amongst ourselves as, as Europeans, although we have also, it's great, we have people from around the world here tonight. Um, I think it's fair to say that if we are to be true cosmopolitans, true Europeans, let's say, then it's important that we are comfortable and at home in our own culture first, in our own language first. Is it not true that we can only embrace somebody else and their culture and their language if we are first comfortable and at home in our own language. I think that's important. Learning, learning in school. There is, I think, um, an important relationship between mother tongue and learning. Um, I underline again, I'm not, I'm not an educationalist, but briefly, briefly looking through the research on this, one can see that th there is a strong body of opinion, not unanimous, it's not unanimous, but there is a strong body of opinion which says that children who learn, first of all, through their mother tongue, learn better. And I think that's important, this idea that children at an early age learn about the relationship between language and symbols on the one hand and meaning on the other. They learn about that through their mother tongue best. So some educationalists have argued that the ideal path for a young child who may be exposed to more than one languages would be to, first of all, really absorb all the skills of literacy in their mother tongue, really master literacy in their mother tongue. Then, through oral skills, pick up the second language, which may be the language of the host country where they're living. 
If we think of a diaspora living abroad, the second language is the, the host country. So pick up the language of the host country through oral skills. And then finally, but only then, only then is the child able to pick up real literacy in the host language through those oral skills. So you start with the mother tongue. The child picks up the basic skills of literacy in their mother tongue, and it's only from there that they are then able to very efficiently pick up literacy in the language of the, the host country. Finally, the last point about the importance of mother tongue. We have to, we have to recognize an unfortunate fact, but it's true, which is that across Europe, we are facing a crisis of illiteracy. Uh, the European Union, north, south, east, and west, is underperforming in the field of literacy. One of the great objectives of the European Union in the field of education is to improve pupils' performance in literacy. So that's the, the background against which we're working. Finally, let me say a few words about what the European Union does. What do we do to support languages and linguistic diversity? Um, as I said, from 2014, a new education and training program will come into force. We've called it Erasmus for All, because Erasmus is one of the best known and most credible brands in the European Union. We, the Commission, have proposed, and we hope that the Parliament will support this, we've proposed to increase the education budget by about 70%, 70%, compared to current spending. We think that that's absolutely realistic and legitimate because of the contribution that education must make to Europe's future prosperity. But still, that 70% increase, which comes to about 19 billion euros over seven years, 19 billion euros between 2014 and 2020, that is still less than 2% of the total EU budget. What do we do? And I think this is where I want to give you something a bit practical and maybe give you a few ideas about how you and your organizations can get involved in the sorts of projects that we will be funding. We're going to do essentially three types of things. Mobility, cooperation, and support to policy reform. Mobility. I think all of us are here are familiar with what Erasmus does in terms of making it possible for millions, millions of young Europeans to study, work, train abroad. But that mobility is also there for teachers. And if we're talking about the teaching of mother tongue across Europe, then I, I would like to think that our ability as the European Union to fund, to finance the mobility of teachers could be part of the solution. The second thing that we do cooperation and partnerships. What do we mean by that? We will fund, we will fund networks of cooperation between educational institutes, local governments, NGOs, business, all coming together to innovate in the field of education. ICT, information and communication technology. This is, this is one of the areas that we want to focus on. And I think for languages, this is particularly interesting. Because if we're talking about diasporas, for example, learning languages perhaps at a distance, then technology must be able to provide some of the answers. One can easily imagine in the future, one can easily imagine projects in the next two or three years between providers of ICT technology, schools, NGOs, language centers, Think of all the cultural institutes that our member states run. They are great. They have great potential to help in this. Put all of these people together to create a European platform for the learning of mother tongue, and perhaps we have an interesting project. I'll leave it there. I hope that that's been useful, both as a perhaps a philosophical taste of why this is important for the European Union, but also a practical taste of what we can do together. Um, and I hope that Erasmus for All um, will be an opportunity 
for some of you in this room and for the organizations that you work for, um, because mother tongue really is something that we need to support. Yorgo, thanks very much. Thanks, Jonathan. We are very uh, grateful that uh, the commissioner responsible for multilingualism has Greek as a mother tongue, um, as a Cypriot. Um, I would like to tell you that um, Mrs. Arvaniti, it's not Arvanitaiki, as a Cretan, of course, I baptize everybody Arvanitaiki or Aiki. Uh, Mrs. Arvaniti um, is part of an innovation of the elder group because it's the first time that we communicate via Skype uh, with somebody outside the room, uh, also to show, and you highlighted it already, that technology is a possibility also for us, uh, for the Greek community worldwide, to improve the methodology uh, of learning uh, Greek language. Um, and that is why and we only have until 1910, so 20 minutes to listen to Mrs. Arvaniti and uh, also to have a question and answer with her. That's why I would like to ask you, because Jonathan might also leave the panel earlier, is there any question or any comment that you would like urgently uh, to do, then do it now before we go to Greece. Yes, please. Uh, thank you very much. Um, one specific question. I have seen the, the program of Erasmus for 2014-2020. Uh, um, I wonder if it will be worth to have specific actions for expatriate EU citizens. We have around 35 EU citizens living outside the European space, and for them there is no any policy for the moment in the European Commission at all, apart from the consular protection, nothing else. And the education, as you referred to the mother tank, it's one of the uh, important issues. It is very interesting to have uh, 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 programs between universities and other institutions, but uh, it I believe it worth to have specific actions uh, exactly addressed to this category of people. 35 million people are not a negligible number. It is a, a country with a big uh, number of citizens, and we completely ignore them. And I'm referring to citizens who are uh, EU passport holders, not second, third, and fourth generation. And uh, I think there is a very big gap over there. Thank you. Mr. Papakos is organizing the, the, not Greeks abroad, but the... I, I, Present myself. I'm the president of an NGO association which is called Europeans in the World, who represents EU citizens abroad from all the European countries. But of course, he's Greek. You want to? <laughs> is there any other comment? One comment here. Uh, my name is Stella Veli. I'm. Um, I have studied physics and informatics, and I have a very uh, difficult problem that I uh, live myself. Uh, when I change an European country with another, it's a very big problem to find a school who my child or my children will be teach in the mother tongue. And I give you an example. You, as European functioner, you have the EU schools where are available all the mother tongue in the European country. Why you don't build these schools in every European country where we, as normal citizens, we can bring the children there? It's a very big problem for the mobility in the EU. In the EU, you have only a mobility uh, for the young people where they have no family. So uh, this uh, impression of a mobility is not for all the people. Thanks very much, Mr. Magrelis. Yes, I would like to ask you if in the concept of the Erasmus IV, um, you said that there are uh, NGOs, uh, schools, etc. If media, uh, public media especially, are included in this uh, concept. Thank you. I think we should leave it there in order to get connection to Greece. John. Thanks, Jurgen. Um, coming to the first question, my first answer is to say that's actually, it's a great question, and it's for the, as part of the democratic process, that's really for the parliament and the member states to decide if, if they want to include something very specific 
uh, for expatriates, then they, you know, you'll go and his colleagues and the member states have the right to do that. Um, we, we have simply put a proposal on the table. What I would say is that there's a balance here. We kept, the, uh, we kept our proposal deliberately very general, simply to keep it as wide open as possible so that as many types of organization can apply as possible, which actually brings me to the third question. Yes, media, including public media, would be very welcome to take part in Erasmus for All as, as providers of education. Um, so I would say we didn't want to be very specific in the proposal. We wouldn't want to point out expatriates, for example. However, if we accept that mother tongue, the learning of mother tongue, is so important, and we do, I think there's a political consensus about that, then the types of project specifically for expatriates we, we would support. So types of project, absolutely yes. Would we, would we want a specific wording in the regulation to support expatriates? Maybe not. But as I said, if, if parliament and council want to do that, absolutely fine. On the question of schools, um, yes. And I think, I think actually, I think you answered your own question because I think European schools as a model is the way forward. And I think something very interesting is happening now, which is that, I think as most of us know, the European schools were, were created for the fonctionnaire, for the people of the institutions. But I think more and more people are starting to recognize that they actually represent a very good model of education. They're not perfect. I'm not saying they're perfect, but they, they represent a very good model. And, and in fact, I think the parliament voted a resolution on this last year, encouraging the commission to, to make this model more widespread. And I think that, that, I, that idea could go, could go a long way. So I think European schools, or European schools and that, that model is, is the way forward. Both of my daughters uh, visit that European school. I will come later uh, to it uh, when we talk about the Greek aspect of the European school. But I would like to say thank you to, to John. Sure. Thank you very, very much. Yeah. We now... Maybe just... yeah. One very small intervention. I listened very carefully and you said that you would leave it up to Parliament in order to do this. I would say to you that most of the parliamentarians read legislation and um, I would speak for some of them that I know are pretty stupid and when they do the legislation they just go yeah along with it because the bureaucrats put it in front of them. If you don't have in the legislation structure that um, sets an amount of money, they won't vote for it and they won't go for it. So as for expats, especially the uh, EU expats is very important. I would encourage you and, and suggest to you that you might want to put that in the legislation, and if the Euro and if the parliamentarians want to take it out, leave them that option. I have to explain. Uh, Jim Karigianis is a Canadian member of Parliament, uh, and uh, your Parliament is different from ours. We are not. Um, I wouldn't say. I wouldn't call all of my colleagues stupid. So uh, you are a politician, <laughs> and what the bureaucrats put in front of you, you vote. And if you want to no, say different, no, no. if you want to say different, I'll challenge you to the test. Okay. Different then, story. then we are different, but I don't want to discuss it now because we have to get connected with Greece. We are really different, but that has other reasons. Yeah, we sit down now, uh, and as when you step or go down stairs, I would like to. Uh, uh, explain who Evgenia Arvaniti is in Greek. Evgenia Arvaniti. Evgenia Arvaniti uh, works at the University of Patras. She is a lecturer who um, teaches issues relating to diversity and heterogeneity. She teaches at the postgraduate program Adult Education of the Hellenic Open University. Mrs. Arvanitis has worked for a number of departments in the Greek Ministry of Education. Can you, can you hear us, Mrs. Arvanitis? You have the floor now. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Shall I, shall I get started? First of all, I want to congratulate the Alliance of Liberals and Democrats for Europe for organizing this. So bravo to you. 
I think that it's the first time, or at least it's the first time that I've had the opportunity to attend a seminar where we can talk about preserving um, uh, mother tongue in Europe. I think that this is perfect. It's a big forum for consultations and discussions so that we can learn from good practices in other countries. I'll be talking about Australia this evening. And it's also an opportunity to exchange valuable experience so that we can move forward with European policies and uh, specific policies in the member states. Today, you've asked me to say a few words about Australia. I'm going to try and show you a small PowerPoint presentation that I've put together. Can you see this on your screen? Can you see my presentation on the screen? Yes, we can, is the answer. I try to be a little bit provocative. I've entitled it Do It Like in Australia. I'm not saying that us Australians are going to tell Europeans how to do their work, but it's good to exchange good practices. And I was in, ten year, I was in Australia for 10 years. I um, did my postgraduate studies there, and I think it's an excellent lab for multiculturalism and the learning of languages. And I think that one can learn a lot from the Australian example. Now, the, the education system in Australia is multicultural. There are 20 million people, and there are 161 languages. Um, and a lot of people speak these 161 languages. Recently, on the basis of widespread consultations, the Australians put together their national education program. And one of the mainstays of this program is language learning. So there are 11 languages that are part of this national studies program, including modern Greek. Thanks to the Greek community and the Ministry of Education back then, it was Mrs. Yeni Meta, and she sent a lot of letters in order to try and influence the consultations and put forward proposals. So modern Greek is now officially one of the 11 languages in the National Education Program. And there's also a lot of money uh, that has been allocated to after-hour schools or afternoon schools. So from 2005 to 2008, 110 million. In Australia, there might not be a lot of money, but there is uh, regular funding for languages. One of the things I would like to draw your attention to is the fact that when it comes to languages, there are three decision-making levels. It depends on the federal state, it depends on the community and how organized they are in pushing things forward, and then it depends on, in the case of Greek, Greek policies and the policies of the Greek state. So on a federal and state and territory level, when it comes to languages, we've got the studies program or education program on a federal level, and then we have the curriculum language standards for the teaching of languages. Teaching and learning languages is something that is taken very serious. It's no laughing matter, and it is included in the curriculum. But this wasn't always the case in the past. So a lot has been achieved, a lot has been accomplished. If you look at the situation 50 to 60 years ago, uh, language diversity was a problem, and there was the white Australia policy and the whole issue of assimilation. Then later on, we had language um, diversity or pluralism because the communities got obtained this right to teach their language. So now languages are seen as a tool that improves or facilitates communication. 
I'm going to send you a copy of my presentation, so I'm not going to go into too detail. So the second level I referred to are the diaspora communities. In our case, the Greek diaspora in Australia. Uh, these are very important bridges of communication. A bridge towards their host country and their country of origin. And these, all these communities have their special features. The strategy followed by each community, uh, of course, isn't the same across the board. Uh, the Greek community has its own strategy. It chooses its own method. And that's because there isn't a um, single faceted uh, relationship here with languages. So there are multiple identities and multiple approaches within the Greek community itself. Third generation children might choose to have different standards. Second generation students and parents might have a different approach. Now, the better organized the community, uh, the better it's going to be able to preserve its language. And the Greek community in Australia is very well organized. There are a lot of Saturday ethnic schools or community language schools as they're called in Australia and so on and so forth. So this um, ethnic and language indicator, if I may put if I might call it that, is very important. And I think that the Greek community is very well organized and therefore its indicator is very high. These aren't like afternoon schools in Germany, like the TEV. These are very different schools. Of course, there are different types of schools. They're not real schools. They're after-hours schools once a week for four hours, but they have been around for more than 100 years, and they're playing a very important role. After-hours schools are recognized uh, as single-language providers by the Australian government. They are schools or bodies, and the grades they give are recognized when it comes to university entrance. I know I'm running out of time, so very quickly, I was listening to uh, the previous speakers, and I think think that it's important to look at the arguments behind preserving uh, mother tongue. In the past, the Greek communities of the diaspora would fall into the same trap again and again, and that is that they would put forward the ethnic arguments for preserving the language. And they would do that when discussing, in this particular case, uh, the, Austrian, uh, the Australian government. And so the Greek community would say, we need to include the Greek language uh, in the national curriculum because it's a very important language or because there are a lot of people who speak this language or because we want to preserve the language because we want to hang on to our identity. Or another argument was, uh, please don't ignore us because we're an important group of voters and if you do that, we'll vote against you. All of these arguments had a kind of expiry date, if I might put it that way. They they wouldn't really make it in the long term. And so that was the Greek community's tack in the past. But I think now we need modern arguments, up-to-date arguments. We need to say that teaching someone their mother tongue is something extremely important. It's an international issue. It goes beyond the borders of a community. And it's very important in uh, molding a strong a sense of citizenship and helps build cohesive societies. So we need to come up with novel arguments, the ones I mentioned and any other ones you might have to, uh, that you might come up with. So why do we want to um, teach people their mother tongue? For various reasons. It's not just for emotional reasons. It's not just because parents want to pass on their language to their children. It's about um, multicultural awareness and perception. It's about citizenship and the relationship between citizenship and language. Mother tongues do contribute to uh, 
molding the citizens of the future. Now, what I'm saying applies to Greeks more than anything else, and we have to make sure that there's a new relationship between Greece and the Greek diaspora abroad. It's important for uh, the different diaspora groups to communicate. Um, in the past, Greece was in the center, and the diaspora had to communicate with Greece, if you like. Now, with Mr. Damanakis, we're looking at a different approach. And Erasmus talks about networking, cooperation, and the feeling of community. In Greece, in the Ministry of Education, we're trying to push things in this direction. Another important issue that we have to grasp in Greece with policy making, and that is that communities have to take the reins into their own hands. We do allow them to do this sometimes, but sometimes we do fall into the temptation to provide easy solutions uh, to tackle these issues. A couple of comments on Greek policy. Yes, we want uh, strategic planning for the teaching of Greek. A uh, new law was adopted a few years ago and some of these issues are included, but above all, it's about cooperation and uh, the sharing of powers. The crisis could be an opportunity and it could bring new uh, ideas to the fore and help us with quality education and training. Uh, the borders of my language are the limitations of my language. Also, the borders are limitations of my world. And that's something that I learned from my own experience. Thank you. I'm at your disposal if you have any questions. Uh, are there any questions? Any comments anybody would like to make? If not, ah, oh. Mrs. Pagliadelli. Let me thank Mrs. Avanitis for the work that she's been doing, but a large extent of the international terminology is based on the Greek language. Oli Rain, for example, used the word marathon without really understanding at the time that it was a, a word of Greek origin. And when you look at the spread of the Greek language. We have to remember that along with Latin, Greece, Greek is a source of scientific terminology throughout the world. Thanks very much indeed. If I can just make an observation about that, it's not just a question of calling things by the right names in our own language is important for the whole world. When we are in a world where you have to fight for funding, we need to make sure that our language and our language methods find their place and fit in to the rest of the world. Yes, it's not really, that, that wasn't really the argument I was putting. I don't know whether you disagree with my observation. No, I'm not disagreeing with you. It's not really a national question. It's simply a question of reality, which is accepted by the world of academia at large. A lot of, a lot of people don't seem to realise that uh, Greek lies at the root of many of the words that they are using. The Chairman, thanks very much, Mrs. Arvanisi. I think we can say that the technology was more or less successful, so thank you very much indeed. Thanks very much indeed, and have a nice evening. <laughs> Let's move on now to a colleague who's already actually spoken briefly, Jim Karianis, who has been a member of the Canadian House of Commons, the... Federal House since 1988. I've known him since I met him in the World Interparliamentary Greek Congress, where I am a vice chairman. He was helping organize the members who are in that grouping of Greek origin. 
uh, people from Canada, people from Jordan, from Egypt, as well as from countries where you wouldn't actually expect to find members of Greek origin. I was struck by Mr. Sklavounos, a colleague of yours who is now a regional minister. You are a federal minister, as a, a federal M MP, but this chap is young, he's 32 years old, he's third generation, and he speaks exceptionally fluent Greek, something which doesn't happen with kids in the United States. So I asked him, how did you learn Greek? And he said, well, it was quite straightforward. There are schools, and if I spoke, because he lives in Quebec, English or French at home, my parents strongly objected. And so this Canada could be an example, really, for the teaching of Greek as a foreign language. So tell us all about that. Thanks very much indeed. Um... Because I can also see that we have other non-Greeks in the room. You do have the talking points. And I won't say everything. You can read what Canada has done and what we haven't done. However, one of the things that we have done in the Canadian in the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, στο Σύνταγμα του Καναδά, υπάρχει κάτι το οποίο λέγεται Minority Language, Language Educational Rights, Language of Instructions. Και σας διαβάζω. Applies whenever the province, the number of children of citizens who have such a right is sufficient to warrant the provision to them out of public funds of minority language instruction. That means that the Canadian Constitution has something in it which says that if there are sufficient children in a region, the education ministry, which is done at regional level, is obliged to provide two and a half hours a week instruction of what I was called the mother language or heritage language. And usually the community picks up another two and a half hours. And the ethnic communities are for all the ethnic communities. To understand that the Canada is 35 million people in Canada. In my constituency, about 82% of them have immigrated to Canada after Nine, sorry, 64% have immigrated to Canada after 1982. We have languages that are, are going into the millions, 1.2 million. Milane, uh, Ukraine. Some speak Ukrainian. We have 1.6 million Chinese, 1.7 million Italians. So you, you understand that minority languages uh, something that we've got plenty of and that we promote. Canada is a trading nation. We don't have any heavy industry. We're traders. Trading with Russia, with uh, Brazil, with Brazil, with India. Imagine that we have 1.2, 1.3 million Indians. Yes. So, uh, just choose one, we'd be very happy to do it in Fine. I'll, do it in, I'll do it in English. I'll do it in English. Fantastite, Tileme, we're talking about mother tongue, and when somebody switches back and forth, there's difficulty. Technical difficulties. So I will stick. How would you prefer, Greek or English? Let's have a show of hands. Elnika. Greek? Who wants Greek? Show of hands. Who prefers English? I'll continue in Greek then. Americas Lexis. Okay. Americas Lexis. Though I will have to use English for one or two words. 
we are a state which is a trading nation, trading with countries as far away as China. China, for us, is our second largest trading partner. And we have at least 1.3 million Chinese living in Canada, and their mother tongue is learnt at the uh, grandfather's knee, and with their parents and grandparents, they learn customs and practices, and they are ready to go back home if necessary. They don't need interpreters. They don't need to be taught their traditions. They learn these things at home. And that's why we can have these trading relations with countries such as that. There are languages which at the moment are taught at school. I mentioned the Greek schools. There are also children from China, from the Middle East. And these languages are taught, and they learn langu three languages, English, Greek, and a French, because, of course, Canada is a bilingual country. In some regions, there are 10 provinces and three territories in Canada, and they have to provide these two and a half hours of language teaching a week if there are sufficient children to justify it. But There's a question as to why the heritage languages, as they are called, which exist in Canada, in Europe, in Australia, in the United States. Very interesting to hear what was done in Australia, and it was something dis not unlike what we do here in, uh, in Canada. And it's the question of learning customs and habits not simply learning so that one can exist properly in the state in which one finds oneself, but also it's a way of minimizing racism. I've got five daughters, two of them are teachers. One's at teacher training college, and the other two are also contemplating a teaching career. So you can see in various regions that you, in the classes, you'll see kids from China, kids from Southern Asia, some five of them will be from Africa. And it's not a question of them just speaking languages between themselves, but also they are encourage other kids to learn glass, learn languages, Chinese, for example, so that they can interchange, trade off, if you like, with one another. And so it's an encouragement to learn languages and also simultaneously to reduce racism. It's, it's not just a question of uh, Greeks. I remember my mother-in-law, when she realised that there were some black people living next door, wasn't uh, particularly happy about it. But when these kids are born, they don't know anything about race, and they don't know anything about the differences between us. And so, having come from a multicultural background, a pluralist background, when they learn these languages at school, when they coexist with other children, I think they avoid racism. That's something we've achieved in Canada. We've got a multiculturalism which has been existing multiculturally for 41 years. We've got a charter which has been uh, translated into 40 different, different languages. And people can read Canada's constitution in Greek. And that's something which is very moving for me. That's a very 
important thing for minorities to be aware of their rights and to be made aware of those rights in their mother tongue. So finally, let me thank my friend Jorgo for the invitation. I'm sure we'll be able to talk later on. I like the idea of having this dialogue between Greek Greeks and Greeks of the diaspora so that children can learn their modern, their mother tongue and that they can get married, they can go to Greece and their children, our children, will be able to continue to exist in this multicultural world. Thanks very much indeed. This thing you were doing at the beginning, this switching of languages, Kerry, who's from the from America and the US and lives in Britain, as well as Artemi, who works in my office, who's a third generation Greek German and speaks a kind of Greek German mixture. Since I am the father of bilingual children, if I would actually rather she spoke one or the other because Artemis, when she goes to Greece, and if she speaks her mixture of Greek and German, no one will understand what she said. And if my daughter spoke to me in German, I often find it difficult to understand. And so I now insist that their children learn their languages correctly. And I say that because in all countries where there is a Greek community, it's always difficult for one to understand the language depending on the way that it's taught. So now Michalis Damanakis, who is chair of the Intercultural and Migration Studies Centre, one of the three parts of the teaching area of Crete University. Go ahead, sir. Thank you very much for the invitation. Yeah. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to take part in this um, fruitful dialogue. I'm going to try and um, tap into my experience from the Greek-speaking communities around the world in order to present uh, different models in Europe and other parts of the world, uh, the spirit and philosophy behind this, and hopefully that will help us along with the discussion we're going to have later. Mrs. Arvanitis and Mr. Karyanis have already helped me because they've referred to two countries that I was going to refer to too. Now, in Australia, up until the 1970s, the policy that was followed could be described as what we uh, call the deficit hypothesis or assumption. So I've got it up here in English and in Greek. What does the deficit hypothesis mean? This means that uh, you feel that this immigrant or citizen uh, lacks knowledge in the language of the country, of your country, and needs to make up for it. You're not really interested in whether they have their own mother tongue or not. Now, but that community language, uh, or rather this, uh, this language is seen as a community language, as the, their business, the business of that particular community. In the 1980s uh, and onwards, the Australians shifted from the deficit hypothesis to what we call the uh, hypothesis of difference. In other words, that these languages were languages that were being spoken in the Australian community and therefore could be included in the official state system. So these were languages that were spoken but were other than English. So L-O-T-E, languages other than English. So from a concept that was based on deficit, we now talk about difference. So now we're saying that there is a certain group, population group, that is speaking a language, and we're going to consider it to be one of the many languages spoken in Australia. They set up this so-called LOAT 
programs, the programs on languages other than English. These were part of the education system and they provided funding to bilingual schools. And one of these bilingual schools is the Greek Community School in Melbourne, uh, which is open to everyone, not just uh, Greek students. So let me now move to Canada. So it's important for you to understand this clearly. So we, m we moved from so-called community languages to languages other than English, L-O-T-E. So this shows you a shift in mentality. Now I'd like to move to Canada. In French-speaking Canada, in the 1970s, there was uh, a turning point. There was a shift. The Quebec government provided funding to bilingual schools, and they still fund bilingual schools. But the, there was a, a certain reason behind this. Uh, the, it was in the government's interest. They provided funding to bilingual schools, and kids would be there until sixth grade. And then after that, they would move on to secondary school in French. So basically, they were indirectly supporting the uh, French-speaking schools. So they were supporting these languages because they also wanted to promote their own interests. Now it's different. Some of these students go on to the English system. But that was the thinking behind this. So the language of the immigrant was used either, we could see it as a tool or a resource. A type of potential, if you like. In Ontario, there's funding for after-hours schools. Mr. Karayanis talked about this or referred to this in his paper, so I'm not going to go into too much detail. Let's move on to the United States of America. Up to the 1990s, there were what were called day schools. Uh, basically, these day schools were usually run by the Greek Orthodox Church of America. Often, you know, uh, parents have to pay fees. There's a certain religious dimension. And these schools still exist today because uh, the American system is based on multiculturalism and pluralism, so there's space for everything. But the schools, uh, there is a caveat, if you like, uh, and that is that the English-speaking part of the curriculum has to be based on the American curriculum. Now, there was a shift in the states. Some states wanted to basically improve uh, state education, which was uh, in dire straits. So again, an interest here. In order to improve state education, they set up what were called charter schools. Uh, public, or rather, uh, state schools funded by the state, but in order to get this funding, they had to be better than the average school. And during this period, Greek schools were set up. We have about seven Greek charter schools, and 80% of the children that attend these schools are not of Greek descent. So all of a sudden, the Greek language was mainstreamed into the American education system because the American government wanted to improve their education system and wanted to promote that interest. So this leads us to the following question. What is a language? Is it a tool that someone uses for their own benefit? Or is it a resource, a deposit, if you like, that you can harness? Uh, scientists have different views. We like having fights so that we can all have our own opinions. But we witness this shift, this development. I've mentioned several countries, and each country uh, has slowly integrated uh, these community languages into their system for different reasons. But now these languages are part of their own system. So now I want to move on to Europe. In the 1960s, uh, 70s, up to the 1980s, basically it was the deficit hypothesis and assimilation approach and the Ausländer pedagogic approach. This is a German term, but this is included, this is used by international scientists. And this basically means that foreigners have to be assimilated into the national system. But things didn't go well. So uh, in the 1980s, 
is uh, there was a shift from the Auslander pedagogic to the interculturalen pedagogic. And there was generous funding. Uh, I think it was uh, DG22 back then that provided the funding. So back then it was the EEC, the European Economic Community, and I think uh, that DG provided funding. But unfortunately, these were pilot projects. They never became widespread. So that is why Europe is somewhere in between the deficit hypoth hypothesis and the difference hypothesis. So it's somewhere in between. And they're good and bad examples. Let's take Berlin, the so-called European state schools, the uh, Staatliche Europa Berlin Schule, are an example. Often you have schools with two languages, Greek, German, or Italian, German, and uh, the, the second language is, or rather these two languages are called partner languages on an equal footing. If you go to Bavaria, you'll find bilingual schools, but there were schools set up in the 60s and 70s based on uh, the original spirit, and they are trapped in this original um, with this original spirit, and that's why they're causing problems for their children. If you go to Rhineland Palatinate, which is where you'll find most Greeks, and you'll find quite a lot of good examples, um, you'll find Greek mother tongue departments, but actually we don't use the word mother tongue anymore, Yorgos will tell you about that. So these departments get funding from the local authority, but then you also get independent Greek schools that were, um, are tolerated by the government and that lead kids to um, a dead end. Let's take England or the UK. In England, they still have the community language approach. They think that the language is the uh, business of the community. But now there will be something called a free school, which will be similar to the charter school, and there might be a change. And be in Belgium, things aren't that different. Uh, uh, ethnic group languages aren't really funded here. It's up to the Greeks to provide funding for the teaching of the Greek language. But what Belgium uh, is interesting for is that it shows you how a language can have two different statuses. A language can be an official recognized language in the European schools, but at the same time, it is the language of immigrants in a wretched poor school. So the same language has this dual status in the same country. I know it might seem critical, but that's how I see things um, now very quickly because I want to wrap up. Europe, as I said, is still between a single language or monolingual assimilation approach and a multilingual, multicultural policy. It is somewhere between the two. It hasn't made up its mind uh, what it wants. That's how I see things. But the fact that is is still in hanging in the balance, that is still in between, means it might shift towards the right direction. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed, Michalis. Can I say something? We were actually going to have the discussion at the end. But if you have a direct question. You were having, we've had two series of speeches where we're focusing on Canada, Australia and the USA. I think that we need to draw a distinction because these countries are, if you like, countries where they have emerged from uh, immigration, have created, been created by immigration. And it's not quite the uh, situation here in Europe where you have stable communities, rooted communities, 
and possibly immigrant isn't quite the right word. It's just, uh, you're right, you're right. If I can respond, Jorgen. Yes, you're quite correct. We are talking about consolidated states here in Europe, not states built on immigration or migration. Well, I've got two comments. Some states in Europe have got the large element of migration in them. Some of these people, have, of course, been around for 60-odd uh, years in these new cases. And if Europe talks about unity within diversity, then it has no other option but to move towards some kind of interstate system where people would be entitled to have, say, a school teaching in Italian here in Brussels, just as a, a Greek would be able to receive education in Greek in Rome. And foundations such as the one that I've talked aren't always w able to work properly anymore. I'm terribly aware of the problems that this can cause between countries. Mr. Hatimasakis, since Mrs. Pallieri has to leave, I'd like to give her the floor now. She's a colleague of course, Crisula Pagliadelli, an archaeologist as well as an MEP. She's someone who's studied or still in fact taking part in archaeological digs. She's set up various programs at primary and secondary education level. She's set up programs for children at primary and secondary level on archaeology and education. Thanks very much indeed for coming along Crisula and let me give you the floor. Let me thank you for having this idea, first of all, Jorgen having set it up. This isn't actually my speciality, though I am a member of the Culture and Education Committee. I've learned a great deal from the previous speakers. And I had wanted to talk about the mother tongue as a tool for the maintenance and the building of one's personality which will last for the whole of one's life. But having listened to what has been said, certain ideas came into my mind and I'd like to share them with you. I'd like to talk about the previous comment. If you look at the way in which Canada and Australia and the US have handle the question of mother tongues, or I don't really like that word, mother, minority languages, national languages, if you like, isn't, in fact, unconnected to the way the states themselves operate. Unfortunately, in Europe, and it's something we can understand very well, in the light of the crisis, which has been with us for the last couple of years, since the shortcomings and the flaws of member states. And it's up to member states, of course, to have responded far more rapidly and work together as a single block of states, as happens in uh, federal states, such as the USA and Australia, and Canada as well, of course. So we in Europe are still in a phase where we do respect diversity and when we take our decisions but with a lot of flaws and weaknesses as far as the implementation of these decisions are concerned and as far as multilingualism is concerned that is and multiculturalism these are two crucial pillars as far as the shaping of the European Union is concerned but when all said and done let's face it We've got new and old member states. Some states have joined very recently with a very different background and history to the so-called old member states. I'm thinking about the new members from former Eastern Europe. And it's not a question of assimilation. It's a question of, I think, it would allow greater confidence and ease when we deal with the question of 
these minority languages. I believe, having listened to Mrs. Vamanaki's deputy, that he, these issues need to be dealt with in a more calm and collected and more European way, not looking at it in a, a nationalist, from a nationalist perspective. We're still creating the European Union, a new kind of union. And I think that the following generations will continue to uh, shape it if we can get through the difficult times that we've got before us at the moment. So we do have these problems, the question of differentiation, the question of the crisis, and all of these issues raised by the keynote speaker. I think that the community is something which is crucially important. It's something that's part of the the European Union's the, the idea of mobility is at the heart of the whole concept of the Union. Students from throughout the world can, since we're talking about Greece, can go to go to Greece and improve their Greek. I know centres of Greek language learning sections in Greek universities which receive such students and can learn from close up the language and culture of the country concerned. That's a very significant work, not simply for language maintenance, but also for language dissemination as well. In the European schools, there is a question here. The fact is that in order for them to work, the economic responsibility ultimately lies in the hands of the member states. And during hard times, which is the one we've got now, I think it's a significant model. Going beyond the concept of schools merely set aside for the children of European officials. We'll have to see what happens on the other side of the crisis. But I think they could serve as a model and work effectively. And all languages would be dealt with on a relationship of strict equality. And these schools, the foundation of, well, they lie at the foundation, I think, of European cohesion. So if we could have a model such as that for the dissemination and of the concept of the coexistence of European languages along the lines that we've got already in the European school. I'm from Salonika and Serefop is there and an awful lot of fighting was take, well, had to take place before we managed to get it there. It's the vocational training centre. We've set up a European type school there as well. We wouldn't have had it before the Serefop came to Salonika, but it's done for the officials who work there. But there are ways, obviously we can't overburden the Greek public sector with expenditures which would be very difficult for them to meet. There's a point I'd like to make, which I noted down having listened to Dr. Arvanitis. I think that the Greek language shouldn't be limited only to members of the Greek diaspora. We need to have a proactive and approach along the lines that the French do with their language. The French government has often promoted the French language and has invested a great deal of money in it. A large number of foundations have been set up and a large number of methods have been thought out and this, so that there is French taught in pretty much every school in all member states. We should, I think, work more actively so that the cultural centres that are being set up under the new bill which would come into a existence if the Greek Education Ministry bill comes through, 
so that we can go beyond the question of simply maintaining our own cultural heritage. That's a good thing, of course. But this idea, this slogan, we're all Greeks, keep on working, all these very important things, these are, I think, positive slogans, for, would be positive slogans for such a movement. So co communities in Greece and outside Greece and the rest of Europe, I think, should find ways of looking at different ways of financing. We've heard from Jonathan, from the Commission, um, mentioning ideas along those lines. I'm not certain, I don't, I'm certain that the local authorities in Greece or the Education Ministry in Greece wouldn't have any objection to taking part in such a, a movement. The universities could run summer schools, they already do, in, uh, in the Aristotelian University in English, for example, and uh, that isn't expensive since the students who come along have to pay fees and they don't just learn the language they learn culture as well they have seminars for modern culture contemporary culture for example we do have an extremely rich recent period of history that we've lived through and I think we need to in fact we could use the uh, fall off in state funding as an incentive, a stimulus to be creative as far as financing is concerned and to continue to push for the teaching of modern Greek. Well, we'll have a short question and answer. Sorry, I don't mean to um, hog the mic, but I just wanted to clarify something on European schools. Yes, of course, it's a model that maybe should be um, copy and pasted, if you like, copied and pasted. We only have 32 schools, but I think that there's been a mistake here. I think that you have the wrong information. 73% of uh, uh, the budget for European schools is covered by the community budget and the commission's budget. It was 185 million euro last year. 20% is paid by the member states and that covers the salaries for the teachers that are seconded to the schools and, and then 7% comes from the fees, uh, t tuition fees paid by students um, uh, who are external students, if we may put it that way. Now, I want to talk about how these European schools are managed. The European schools are the only European body that basically doesn't fall within the remit to the ECJ. You cannot sue a European school or take it to the European Court of Justice. You can't because of its structure and because of its administration and the way it's managed, which I think is unacceptable, frankly. I mean, this is a different topic, but let me say that the European Commission, which provides almost 75% uh, of uh, the money, only has one vote out of a total of 27 on the board. Secondly, I talked about educating Greeks abroad, and I think that the European school model is an excellent model that could be used in order to save money in third countries. You talked about the Francophonie, uh, the French-speaking model um, that, of course, is funded by private sponsors as well, and not just the French government. I think this could be turned into a European model, and if there were a common infrastructure, it would mean that more than one mother tongue would be taught, okay, like in the European schools, but maybe on a smaller scale. Uh... Thank you very much. I was aware of the percentages, but it's also about finding uh, buildings uh, because the uh, local authorities' indifference uh, puts people off. 
I looked at whether we could do something like that in Thessaloniki, and things aren't easy. Even though we're talking about smaller amounts, uh, it's basically almost impossible to get the resources. But there's also a lot of indifference, not 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 the um, the state, but the local the local authorities and local government. Jim, no microphone. <laughs> You're talking about immigration in Europe for 60 years, and now you're saying that there's been an economic crisis for two years. If you do the maths, what, hap what happened in the uh, last 58 years? We're talking about seven to 10 million Greeks living abroad, two and a half million in Europe, 350,000 in Canada, so that's a million, another million in Australia, and then some in Russia. But if you deduct those, then that means that if you uh, subtract those, that means that there are three to four million Greeks in Greece, in, in Europe. In Australia, there are 17 MPs. In Canada, there are six of Greek descent. There are 30 in Russia. What are you doing in Europe? What are you up to? What are you doing here in the EU? So, as I said, you need to be proactive and aggressive so that you don't have these 60 years and the last two years which are a crisis. Let's talk about Europe. We've got an organizational hitch. The a bus to Cologne leaves at 8. Can you please do something to make sure it leaves at 8.15? And there's also a bus uh, taking the Cretans to a restaurant that leaves at 8.15, so please try and change that too. Now, let's talk about Europe. Listen, it's always like this in here. In the Parliament, we talk a lot. So I'm going to give the floor to Manolis Alexakis. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Mr. Alexakis is an expert on Greek language education in Western Europe. And let me tell you that my daughters uh, go to the European school. They go to the German section, I must say, in Luxembourg. They went to first grade, German section, uh, section, and then in second grade they started learning Greek. And when they went to their Greek classes for the first time, they didn't want to go. They had to go in the afternoon, and of course they didn't want to go. But after the first class, they said, when's the next class, Dad? They loved the lessons. And I'm going to tell you that the teacher is called Yorgos Gaitadzis, and I think he, uh, he basically... You're his boss, if I might put it that way. Uh, but he's f fabulous. He uses games. He uses a fantastic teaching method, which makes kids want to learn Greek. And I'm going to tell you a secret. When I started off as an MEP in uh, Brussels uh, a few years ago, my Greek was pretty poor. Yes, I did go to that interparliamentary forum. But I basically had to sit down and um, work hard and learn. And I've got a teacher who teaches me Greek. He's a writer, so his Greek is very good. Tomorrow, oh, we'll, uh, tomorrow we're going to be presenting one of his books. It's basically uh, Manolis Alexakis, and he does this for free. He comes to my office two, three times a week and gives me these excellent Greek lessons for free. Maybe I'll write a book in Greek in the future. Who knows? Well, let's give the floor to Manolis Alexakis. He's got some great news to impart, uh, and uh, it might be about setting up a new foundation. Thank you, Yorgo. I think that Chrysula Pagliadeli 
basically introduced this in the best possible way. She talked about the Greek language and how through Greek culture it can actually be a tool that will promote Greek culture and civilization, but that will basically uh, help preserve the Greek identity of Greek children living abroad. I'm very pleased that they're friends here from Cologne and Dusseldorf. I lived there for five to six years and I've got excellent friends and I'm also very pleased because my Cretan friends are here with us. Now, with Yorgos, uh, about five months ago, we started having discussions and uh, trying to look at how we can, how we could do something positive uh, during the crisis. We've had these ideas for years, but we've never put them into practice, and we think that Greece and Greeks need them. So we we want to set up an institute for uh, the Greek language and uh, Greek culture. Now, this will be for Greek students of Greek descent, and for any young person who wants to learn Greek, for adults, special professional groups or professional orders. And of course, they'll be able to provide certification to bodies that teach the Greek language. We want this foundation or institute to set up a Greek language teaching model uh, by harnessing material that's already being produced by other bodies in Greece and that, of course, we're going to have to work hand in hand with. This uh, institute um, could also publish teaching material, books, new teaching methods, because it is possible to do this. And it can also publish um, books of a general nature that will promote Greek language and culture. And of course, it will hopefully be able to organize events, seminars, and so on and so forth. So what is this going to be like? It's going to be a non-profit organization. It's going to be funded by sponsor sponsors and benefactors. Um, as well as donors. I'm not quite sure I like the word sponsors. I might delete them for the next presentation. And it also might get funding from other foundations who have similar uh, purposes. There's the Onassis Foundation, the Nyarchos Foundation, other similar foundations that might be interested in providing us with funding. And George and I have already started getting in touch with them. And then, of course, some of the funding will come from own resources, um, to, uh, fee, tuition fees, publications, and so on and so forth. Um, we'll organize language and culture seminars and events. And then hopefully we'll also get funding from the Greek states if we reach an agreement which will give this institute um, the possibility of being responsible for teaching Greek. So how is this going to be managed? Will it be a management board or a board of administration made up of distinguished personalities, uh, representatives of foundations that we work with, the Greek Culture Foundation, Ediame, which is the Intercultural and Migration Studies Center and so forth, sponsors and benefactors, and representatives of the church. There will also be an executive committee that will be responsible, will be a kind of steering committee, if you like, and will be responsible for the scientific dimension of this. And then, of course, there will be a network of people who will work with the foundation in, in any city or region where there are Greek language departments. Now, we said with Mr. Hadzi Markakis from the beginning that it's important for there to be flexible cooperation with bodies that are still there. We want to set up a new model, but we don't want to get rid of activities or initiatives that are already out there. Synergies. I talked about our partners 
Ediame, the Intercultural and Migration Studies Centre, will be one of them. They've done excellent work. I'm very pleased that Mr. Damanakis is here with us. And he talked about what's happening all over the world. But his centre um, publishes excellent teaching materials. They do unique work. Then there's the Manolis Triandefilidis Foundation, the Greek Language Centre for the Certification of Language Learning, and so on and so forth. I mean, the possibilities are endless. Let us take a look at uh, potential students. On the basis of current statistics, there's 70,000 children all over the world who are learning Greek, and most of them are of Greek descent. Another potential group we can tap into are adults. Wherever we've been daring and wherever we've been able to uh, help support uh, departments that teach Greeks to adults, the participation has been excellent from Paris to Palermo, because this is kind of my um, neck of the woods, Marseille, you name it. Another uh, potential area we can develop are uh, professionals who are interested in terminology. I'm thinking of businesses, companies that uh, trade with Greece, that are in touch with Greece, that send their employees to Greece. So we could set up terminology departments or sections. And now with the Greek Language Center in Brussels, we've made some headway with discussions because together with universities, we can set up these terminology departments. There'll be exchanges, visits, uh, including students, university students, school students, and of course, seminars, in, seminars that focus on ancient Greek culture, modern Greek culture, theater, philosophy, art, and so on and so forth. Now, some interesting figures. The cost of education abroad for the Greek state after the cuts are 60 to 70 million euro a year for, as I said, approximately 65,000 students. At least that's the number, the official f figure. And the 1,800 teachers that have been, and professors that have been seconded around the world. Now, our estimate of, um, for, of operational costs for this institute include rent, teaching hours, among other things. The costs would probably amount to 15 million euro a year. 50% would be covered by the institute's turnover. And for the other 50%, uh, we would need uh, to use um, institute revenue and uh, uh, donations from sponsors. So this is an idea that we came up with with came up with, with George Hadzimarkakis. We've, we've been mulling this over and working on it. Against the backdrop of the crisis, it's important to really focus on the substance of this without uh, being in, in a straitjacket, without being too regi rigid and inflexible, because when we talk about the Greek language and how the Greek language has been taught abroad, it's true that uh, there are certain habits, if you like, uh, habits and traditions that are difficult to change. I think there are a lot of interesting things to do in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Manolis. Now we turn to Nikos Megrelis, who is a journalist but also a director of Earth World. TV plays a vital role, is far not just a projection, but in the actual learning of languages throughout the world. So we can hear from the director, who is going to be our final speaker. Thanks very much. Good evening. Thank you for the invitation, Jorgo. I feel... I did switch it on. I think that we're in this idea where there are all these ideas, but we have to fight through the crisis. There's an awful lot of poverty and uh, happiness in Greece, and we need to find new methods to try to get through the crisis. We feel that the sky is full in on us to a certain extent. But here, sitting at this table, I've listened to all sorts of ideas and ideas coming 
from a different side, not from the uh, state side, but from the idea of people putting forward personal contributions, personal innovations, and the concept of solidarity running through the whole thing. That's very, very important. Coming on to my topic, the role of public television in the maintenance and spread of our mother tongue of Greek. There is a founding charter, of course, for the public broadcasting, but that's not enough. What is TV doing? It's trying, along with other channels, to put out broadcasts where Greek is spoken correctly. Also, we have the satellite channel, of course, and we want to try to reach out to Greeks of second and third generation who don't always interact well with the language. It's not necessarily their fault. It's simply because they've been growing up a long way from home. They might not be able to go to get lessons at school. They might not have a father or a grandmother who would be able to teach them to read or write, as happens in other Greek families. They might be from a mixed marriage. All of these factors are leading to a new generation of people who don't have the immediate contact that the first generation did with the Greek language. So these are the people we need to reach. And I grew up in Italy. I wasn't born in Greece, and I went to Greece when I was seven in order to go to school. And I, if I'd stayed in uh, Genoa, my Greek probably wouldn't be very good, but I live with my grandparents and obviously improve. We've got Ert World, as I've mentioned. It's really set up by people and aimed at people who are, love Greece and are interested in Greece. And there is, in fact, a English language news broadcast as well, but we also try to put out programmes which will encourage the viewer to love Greece. And at the same time, we're trying to project certain ideas that are important as well. Some of the programmes, for example, are in Greek, but subtitled in English, so that people will be able to understand what's going on. Is that enough? Well, I would say no, it's not. If I were to give a score to the role played by public television and what we do as far as promoting the Greek language is concerned, I think the score would be pretty low. It's really not very impressive. Why is it unimpressive? I think, to be totally honest with you, the problem is partly lies with politics, with politicians, where, frankly, Greeks living outside Greece were a low priority. The exception here is the Education Ministry, which has made huge efforts as far as Greek schools are concerned, and also certain groupings or clusters of Greeks living abroad. The Greek state has really never really had much of a regard for Greeks abroad, and that attitude was followed by the rest of the public sector, including public television. So the first thing that we need to do, and I've been struggling to achieve this as director, is to rejig public television priorities with the programmes that are broadcast outside Greece, through Earth World, that's to say. What can happen? What can we do? Well, I've heard a lot of ideas this evening. And I think it would be good if public TV could be a player in the institute that we've heard of for, about, for example. And also, we would be able to help, we stand ready to help in any way, to spread the Greek language. We had special programmes about Elitius or Seferis, for example. Those could be subtitled and they could be provided free of charge. That really doesn't cost very much at all. 
but I've said, although there are these ideas, we need to have some mechanism to enable them to work. And people will say, no, hang on, we've got a crisis, let's do it tomorrow. I'm, I'm not making enough money to do extra work, etc. So there is this kind of clash between what we need to do, what needs to be done in order to escape from the crisis and those who are hoping to be saved by some outside assistance. I think that what we need to do is to put together a series of programs on the learning of the Greek language which could be dealt with through the social media and through the net. The BBC is a very good example of how that can be done. We actually wanted to have some kind of electronic game for learning of the learning of Greek. We actually made some progress on that. It was very good. It had various Greek words. And it was basically a game of hangman. People had to try to find out what the word was. And similar type words would also appear on the screen, ones with the same meaning. And what happened? The problem was, it wasn't a question of money even, the problem was that technically we weren't able to provide a, a thousand euros. I'm terribly embarrassed about this. to the scientific staff. So we couldn't actually market the thing. And another thing which public television could do, and with the low staffing levels and the uh, low financial powers that Air World has, one has to remember that our resources are limited, but we should take part in international initiatives for the protection and the spreading of the Greek language. There are a large number of countries where there's no link whatsoever as far as the language is concerned. But let me give you a personal view. I actually have to answer my own telephone, for example, that's just to show how low the staffing levels are where we work. And there is a board running at at the moment, which is understands the importance of satellite television and is making an effort. But the problem is, as I said before, we have got the feeling of helplessness and the weakness that everybody feels and the need that we are stuck in this feeling of inertia about the crisis. Well, thank you very much for listening to me. Let me thank Yorgos Hadzimakakis once again for having the, the initiative to hold this evening's meeting. And I think that next time I'll be very happy to come along to talk to you again. Libon, <laughs> The interpreters have to leave at 8.15, so I'm afraid we're going to have to continue in Greek. <laughs> and uh, the chairman kindly thanks the interpreters. Λοιπόν, θα δώσω προτεραιότητα στους κολονία Düsseldorf. Έχετε ερώτηση, τοποθέτηση να κάνετε εδώ και μετά πάμε. Παρακαλώ. Γεια σας. Έχω μία παρατήρηση για τον κύριο Αλεξάκη. Αυτό που με έλειψε, πρώτα απ' όλα συγχαρητήρια για την ιδέα σας, ε, αυτό που μου έλειψε και μου έκανε και μεγάλη εντύπωση είναι το ότι δεν αναφέρατε καθόλου ε, e-learning. Ε, το άκουσα βέβαια σήμερα και χαίρομαι το ότι ε, το έχετε στο πρόγραμμα τουλάχιστον στην Ευρωπαϊκή Ένωση, αλλά μου έλειψε τελείως από το δικό σας ε, draft για την ιδέα που έχετε και πιστεύω με αυτό θα μπορέσετε να... Ε, Λυπάμαι για τα ελληνικά μου, αλλά ζω πολλά χρόνια στη Γερμανία. Θα μπορέσετε να προσεγγίσετε πολύ κόσμο και με λίγα χρήματα. Και ίσως 
Ε, με την ευκαιρία που είστε με τον κύριο Μεγκρελή εδώ πέρα, θα μπορέσετε να βρείτε και τρόπους ώστε να, ε, να κάνετε μικρά πράγματα και για πολλές ηλικίε και σε διαφορετικά επίπεδα γλωσσικά για τους Έλληνες του εξωτερικού. Δηλαδή χρειαζόμαστε και για μικρά παιδιά, χρειαζόμαστε και για ενήλικες και πάνω απ' όλα χρειαζόμαστε πιο λίγο ελίτη ε, και λογοτεχνία, χρειαζόμαστε πιο πολύ διαφορετικά επίπεδα, απλά, για τους απλούς ανθρώπους και τα χρειαζόμαστε γρήγορα. Και σας παρακαλώ, επειδή έχω ακούσει πως κλείνουν και τα ελληνικά σχολεία, σας παρακαλώ να είστε γρήγοροι, είστε σε θέσεις κλειδιά και πιστεύω πως μπορείτε να κάνετε κάτι. Ευχαριστώ πάρα πολύ. Δίνω τον λόγο, Μπράβο. Δίνω τον λόγο στον Γιώργο τον Αεράκη, τον Αντιδήμαρχο Ηρακλείου. Ευχαριστώ πολύ Γιώργο, ευχαριστώ για την πρόσκληση. Ε, θα σας πω λίγο για την Ευρώπη, γιατί τα, πραγματικά δεν ξέρω πώς λειτουργεί το σύστημα στην Αμερική, όπου νομίζω ότι είναι πίσω από όλα σχεδόν η Εκκλησία όσον αφορά τη γλώσσα. Ε, στη δεκαετία του 1960, όπως γνωρίζετε, οι Έλληνες πανικόβλητοι εγκατέλειπαν τα χωριά τους και πήγαν κυρίως στο Βέλγιο, στη Γερμανία και στη Σουηδία. Η πάντα φτωχή... Η πάντα φτωχή Ελλάδα ανταποκρίθηκε, θέλω να πιστεύω, με το παραπάνω στην πρόκληση της εποχής και έστελνε δασκάλους και στη συνέχεια καθηγητές σε όλες αυτές τις χώρες και τα παιδιά των μεταναστών δεν έχασαν ποτέ την επαφή με την ελληνική γλώσσα. Είναι σημαντικό να το λέμε αυτό, διότι ζώντας στο Ηράκλειο τον τελευταίο χρόνο και ξέροντας ότι υπάρχουν δεκάδες Γερμανοί, Δανοί, Γάλλοι και Άγγλοι, αλλά και με τις επαφές που έχω στη Ρόδο, που υπάρχουν αντίστοιχες δυνατότητες, να ξέρετε ότι αυτές οι χώρες δεν στέλνουν δάσκαλο να διδάξει τα παιδιά αυτά. Και αυτό τιμάει τη χώρα μας, αν θέλετε, από το 60 και μετά που το κάνει, με όλες τις οικονομικές δυσκολίες που είχε. Ε, τα τελευταία χρόνια η κατάσταση δεν είναι απλά δύσκολη, είναι τραγική. Ε, μαθαίνω ότι στον προϋπολογισμό του προηγούμενου έτους 30% αν δεν κάνω λάθο, του ποσού περικόπηκε όσον αφορά την εκμάθηση της γλώσσας στα ευρωπαϊκά σχολεία. Αυτό πρέπει να μας κάνει όλους εμάς να οδηγηθούμε σε άλλες λύσεις και σωστά υπόθηκε προηγουμένω. Πρέπει να αναζητήσουμε και τους χορηγούς και πρέπει να ζητήσουμε και από τους γονείς ίσως να βάλουν το χέρι στη τσέπη Όσοι από αυτούς μπορούν να ανταποκριθούν, δεν είναι ντροπή να το πούμε αυτό, παιδιά, ε, διότι πραγματικά η Ελλάδα δεν μπορεί να ανταποκριθεί. Και θα γίνεται όλο και πιο δύσκολο αυτό το πράγμα. Εγώ, ζώντας στο Λουξεμβούργο 25 χρόνια και πηγαίνοντας τα παιδιά μου στο Ευρωπαϊκό Σχολείο, δεν είχα ιδιαίτερο πρόβλημα. Τα παιδιά του, του Γιώργου του Χατζημαρκάκη, όμως, που θέλαν να μάθουν ελληνικά με ελληνίδα δασκάλα... Η, η Ελλάδα ανταποκρίθηκε στο αίτημα και έχει και τον Γιώργο τον Καϊτατζή και νομίζω και έναν δεύτερο δάσκαλο και καθηγητή στο, οι οποίοι κάνουν εξαιρετική δουλειά και χαίρομαι που τους ανέφερε Γιώργο, τους γνωρίζω προσωπικά. Ε, ίσως λοιπόν στο Λουξεβούρο το οποίο είναι μια χώρα με υψηλού εισοδήματο και Έλληνε, θα έπρεπε αυτούς τους δασκάλους κατά τη γνώμη μου να του πληρώνουν οι γονεί. όπου μπορούν να ανταποκριθούν. Μια πρόταση. Το Ινστιτούτο είναι η ιδέα που θέλει να καλύψει ακριβώ αυτή την ιδέα. Παρακαλώ, εσεί και μετά. Δημητρακόπουλο, είμαι πρώην πρόεδρο του Συλλόγου Νέων και Κυδεμών των Σχολείων Μητρική. Το υπογραμμίζω στι Βρυξέλλε. Ε, σαν γονέα και σαν άτομο που έχει ασχοληθεί με την εκπαίδευση, διαφωνώ ριζικά με όλα αυτά που ακούω. Διαφωνώ με το ότι δεν υπάρχουν χρήματα. Βρήκαμε την εύκολη λύση. Παλιά που υπήρχαν χρήματα και ζητούσαμε αναδιοργάνωση και εξοικονόμηση πόρων, αυτό που μας ενδιαφέρε στην Ελλάδα ήταν πώς θα στείλουμε εκπαιδευτικού και να βολέψουν τους συμμέτερους. Δεν ενδιαφερθήκαμε ποτέ να αντιμετωπίσουμε το πρόβλημα στη ρίζα του. Πρώτο. Δεύτερον, τα, τα σχολεία επιδικής για μένα έχουν πολύ μεγαλύτερη σημασία από το αμυγέ που υπάρχει και καλύπτει 80 άτομα. Είχαμε 600 μαθητές πριν μερικά χρόνια, ήδη με την πολιτική που ακολουθείτε έχουμε πέσει στους 350 μέτρα, περίπου. Λοιπόν, δεν είναι κατάσταση, δεν μπορούμε να παραμελήσουμε ούτε να βλέπουμε μόνο ελιτιστικά το θέμα. Τα προβλήματα είναι ουσιαστικά και αφορούν τα παιδιά των Ελλήνων, 
ομογενών εδώ δεν αφορούν μόνο τους προνομιούχους. Λοιπόν, τα παιδιά μου μιλάνε καλά ελληνικά γιατί τους καθιέρωσα στο, σχολή, στο σπίτι να τους απαγόρεψα να μιλάνε άλλη γλώσσα από τα ελληνικά. Λοιπόν, πρέ, εν τω μεταξύ όσο δεν φορά για τηλεό, τηλεόραση που συζητάμε, η τηλεόραση πρέπει, συμφωνώ λίγο με τον κύριο, δεν έχουν κίνητα τα παιδιά παρά την πίεση, παρά το ότι ξέρουν τα ελληνικά, οι περισσότερε εκπομπέ δεν τα τραβάνε, δεν έχουν αρκετά. Χρειάζεται κάτι άλλο. Εκεί πρέπει να ψαχτεί. Και λυπάμαι που σήμερα δεν έχουμε το χρόνο να βαθύνουμε και αυτά τα θέματα, γιατί βλέπω ότι η ώρα τελειώνει. Όσον αφορά το ίδρυμα που πρότεινε ο κ. Αλεξάκη, επίση διαφωνώ. Συμφωνώ με την ιδέα απόλυτα, αλλά διαφωνώ να είναι ει βάρο τη ε, εκμάθηση τη ελληνική, τη εθνοτική, όπω τη λέμε τώρα, γλώσσα εδώ. Στο Βέλγιο. Σε καμία περίπτωση κατ' επέ, δεν πρέπει να είναι το ένα εις βάρος του άλλου. Σαν σύνε. Όσον αφορά, αφορά την οικονομία, μα έχουν, μας έχουν ζαλίσει εδώ, καθ, χάνουμε, έχουμε ένα εκατομμύριο δημόσιους υπαλλήλου στον Ευρή και στο Σενό δημόσιο τομέα. Έχω, γνωρίζω 50 άτομα μόνο στην Καλαμάτα από την οποία κατάγομαι. Έχει σταματήσει η γραμμή του τρένου Αθήνα-Καλαμάτα και πληρώνονται 100 υπάλληλοι τζάπα και κάθονται. Λοιπόν, μην λέμε τώρα ότι θέλουμε να βρούμε χρήματα. Υπάρχουν τόσες και τόσες υπηρεσίες, ε, δέκο, ε, οργανισμοί που πληρώνουν με τον κόσμο να κάθεται. Εδώ στην Ολυμπιακή Εταιρεία πληρώνουν δύο χρόνια μετά που είχε σταματήσει η γραμμή. Λοιπόν, χρήματα νομίζω μπορούμε να βρούμε αλλού. Η παιδεία και ο πολιτισμός είναι, θα πρέπει να είναι η κατεξοχή προτεραιότητα του ελληνικού κράτους και σε μας. Να διαθέσουμε τα απαραίτητα να στηρίξουμε και να προωθήσουμε και παιδεία και ελληνισμό κατά προτεραιότητα. Ακριβώς γι' αυτό γίνεται η εκδηλώση. Μπράβο. Παρακαλώ. Προτείνατε δύο συστήματα εδώ στην Αυστραλία και στον Καναδά, ε, τα οποία εντάξαν την ελληνική γλώσσα μέσα στο σχολικό του σύστημα. Από... Και αυτή είναι η επιτυχία για αυτά τα δύο σχολικά συστήματα. Και αυτό θέλουμε να πετύχουμε, πιστεύω, όλοι μας στην Ευρώπη. Mm -hmm. Τα μοντέλα σχολείων αυτά υπάρχουν ήδη, τουλάχιστον στην Ενανία Βεσφαλία υπάρχουν. Γιατί να μην στηρίξουμε τέτοιου είδου σχολεία που έχουν την ελληνική γλώσσα μέσα στο, στο γερμανικό σχολείο και το παιδί... Γιατί τελικά σε αυτό το πρόγραμμα που προτείνετε εσείς δεν κατάλαβα το κίνητρο να έρθει το παιδί, ποιο θα είναι. Ο στόχος του ποιο θα είναι. Θα μπορεί με το βαθμό αυτό να περάσει το πανεπιστήμιο, να μετράει ο βαθμό αυτό για το πανεπιστήμιο. Δεν μπαίνουν αυτά τα πράγματα μέσα στο, μέσα στον προγραμματισμό που κάνατε. Και εμεί θέλουμε μια ελληνική γλώσσα που να είναι ενταγμένη στο σχολικό σύστημα τη χώρα που ζούμε. Ευχαριστώ. Εσεί και μετά ο Νίκ. Εν μέρη, Γιάννη είναι το όνομά μου. Η εν μέρη με κάλυψε η συνάδελφο από τον Ντουίσσελντορφ επίση και εγώ. Και θέλω να σας αναφέρω μία συγκεκριμένη περίπτωση, την οποία γνωρίζει ο κύριος Δαμανάκης πολύ καλά. Εργάζομαι από το 1980 στο δίγλωσο κλάδο του Γυμνασίου Λάιμνιτς. Εδώ έχουμε ένα σύστημα το οποίο λειτουργεί πολύ καλά, διότι διδάσκεται η ελληνική γλώσσα και ένα δευτερεύον μάθημα ενταγμένο μέσα στο πρωινό πρόγραμμα. Χρηματοδοτείται αποκλειστικά από τη γερμανική πλευρά. Τα παιδιά κάνουν αμπιτού απρίφου, Ωστόσο, μέχρι τώρα δεν έχουμε καταφέρει να έχουμε μία υποστήριξη από το ελληνικό κράτος. Δεν, όσες φορές απευθυνθήκαμε στην Ελλάδα να μας αναγνωρίσουν τον τίτλο αυτό στην Ελλάδα, μας είπαν ότι έχουν πολλά άλλα προβλήματα να ασχοληθούν με τα ελληνικά σχολεία και δεν ασχολούνται με τα γερμανικά προγράμματα. Δηλαδή από τους Γερμανούς έχουμε την υποστήριξη, όχι όμως από την Ελλάδα. Με το αποτέλεσμα να μην έχουμε μέχρι τώρα αρκετούς Έλληνες μαθητές ή μαθητές, τέλος πάντων, από τους μικτούς γάμους που θα έχουν ενδιαφέρον να μάθουν τη γλώσσα. Διότι οι Έλληνες ή μας θεωρούν ανταγωνιστές για το αμυγές σχολείο ή ε, πηγαίνουν κατευθείαν στα καθαρά γερμανικά σχολεία χωρίς να έχουν καμία πρόσβαση στην ελληνική γλώσσα. Αποτέλεσμα για την επόμενη σχολική χρονιά έχουμε μόνο εννέα δηλώσεις για την πέμπτη τάξη. Αυτό είναι απαράδεκτο σε ένα σύστημα που λειτουργεί τόσα πολλά χρόνια. Μας ανέχονται οι Γερμανοί και το χρηματοδοτούν αποκλειστικά. Ε, βρισκόμαστε εδώ τρεις εκπαιδευτικοί από αυτό το σχολείο. 
και πιστεύω η δουλειά που προσφέρουμε είναι παραδειγματική. Ωστόσο, δεν έχουμε απήχηση. Ευχαριστώ. Έχω τους τελευταίους τρεις. Ένα, δύο, τρία και κλείνουμε και... Γιώργο, δεν ξέρω αν η ερώτηση είναι εκτός θέματος. Αλλά στην Ελλάδα έχουμε και τα σχολεία που είναι τη διαπολιτισμικής εκπαίδευσης. Στα οποία έχουμε παιδιά τα οποία είναι ανθρώπων που έχουν πάει πίσω στην Ελλάδα. Έχουμε παιδιά πολιτικών μεταναστών και παιδιά που είναι οικονομικών μεταναστών. Πώς θα μπορούσαμε να αναμορφώσουμε και εκείνα τα σχολεία για να μπορούμε να εντάξουμε τα παιδιά στην ελληνική κοινωνία. Ευχαριστώ. Νίκη από τον Καναδά. Ε, παρακαλώ. I, I will speak in English because I, 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 don't, uh, I don't speak uh, Greek. So I have a small proposition um, concerning the Greek language, Latin language, and improving the education system. Uh, I have a very good experience with children between 12 and 60 years than they have in the school Greek and all Greek and Latin languages uh, for uh, general knowledges. They help them very much to understand um, the other words, uh, scientific words, that are uh, used uh, for their uh, further studies. So what I propose that is not bad to have in the uh, European community such a general uh, no courses for knowledge in Greek and Latin in every school. Uh, so perhaps it's not bad uh, to 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 take this uh, like proposition as a proposition. Thank you very much. You're from Italy. I'm from Germany. <laughs> Oh, Germany. <laughs> Interesting. So uh, the, I, I must leave because I don't understand. No I'm problem. staying here Thank only to propose this. Thank you. That I have a very, very good experience with children. They Thank are you. between 12 and 16, and 16. years. Not farther, f not smaller, and yeah. not older. We got the message. Yeah. Thank, Thank you for the suggestion. Telefteos, Ella. Ε, αγαπώ Αγαπάκης Δημήτρης, λέγομαι, είμαι από, το, από την Κρήτη. Ήθελα να συμμετάσχω στη διαδικασία διαβούλευσης, γιατί τουλάχιστον έτσι την εισπράττω, όσον αφορά την πρόταση σχετικά με το Διεθνές Ίδρυμα Ελληνικής Γλώσσας που προτείνατε. Ε, κύριε Αλεξάκη και κύριε Χατζημαρκάκη. Ήθελα λοιπόν να καταθέσω κι εγώ μια σκέψη, την οποία θεωρώ ότι ίσως μπορεί να ενταχθεί σε αυτή την πρόταση, συνδέοντας τη σκέψη αυτή με αυτά που αναφέραμε χθες και αφορούν τις κοινωνίες των πολιτών, τον εθελοντισμό και την ε, εσωτερική ικανοποίηση που μπορεί να νιώθει κάποιος συμμετέχοντας σε αυτές τις διαδικασίες. Θεωρώ λοιπόν ότι ίσως μπορεί να βοηθήσει η συμμετοχή εθελοντών εκπαιδευτικών οι οποίοι αυτή τη στιγμή έχουν διάθεση νομίζω να συμμετέχουν συνδέοντας με αυτό που ακούστηκε πριν, ίσως βέβαια σε μια λίγο διαφορετική διαδικασία, η learning, αλλά ζωντανά, έτσι ώστε η διδασκαλία θα μπορεί να προσαρμόζεται και στις απαιτήσεις, κυρίως του ενήλικα, παρά σε μαθητές, έτσι ώστε να μπορεί να γίνεται και ανταποδοτική και να γίνεται και πολύ πιο σαφέστερη και πιο προσωποποιημένη η διδασκαλία. Άρα θεωρώ λοιπόν ότι μπορεί πολίτες, ειδικά από την Ελλάδα και σε συνεργασία τόσο με συλλόγους διδασκόντων είτε πρωτοβάθμιας είτε δευτεροβάθμιας συγγνώμη, εκπαίδευσης αλλά και με τις αρχές τοπικής αυτοδιοίκησης είτε πρώτη και δεύτερου βαθμού αυτή η προσπάθεια να ενδυναμωθεί και να ξεκινήσει έτσι πιο δυναμικά και άμεσα. Ευχαριστώ πολύ. Ευχαριστώ. Περνάμε πάλι στο πάνελ. Ο καθένα ένα λεπτάκι, γιατί πρέπει να πραγματικά να φύγουμε. Να αρχίσουμε με τον Μανώλη. Να πω για το e-learning ότι δεν αναφέρθηκα καθόλου σε μεθόδου διδασκαλία, γιατί είχα 8 λεπτά και έπρεπε. Εννοείται ότι το e-learning είναι μέσα στι μεθόδου που δεν μπορεί να μην τι χρησιμοποιήσει πλέον και ειδικά σε αυτή την περίπτωση που πρέπει να φτάσουμε και στον τελευταίο άνθρωπο ή Ελληνόπουλο 
που ζει σε ένα χωριό της Γερμανίας. Ναι. Και νομίζω ότι αυτό είναι έτσι. Τώρα, ε, όσον αφορά την ένταξη των ελληνικών σε σχολεία κτλ. Ε, αυτό το Ινστιτούτο δεν θα καταργήσει σε καμία περίπτωση τις ε, δομές αυτές. Θα λειτουργήσει συμπληρωματικά. Ε, βεβαίως. Δεν αφορά... Ε, αφορά, αφορά προσέξτε αφορά στη διδασκαλία της ελληνικής ως μητρικής γλώσσας, κυρίως για τους νέους. Οι πρωτοβουλίες, οι υπόλοιπες που έχουν να κάνουν με δίγλωσσα μοντέλα και τα λοιπά, προχωρούν και γι' αυτό μίλησα και για συνεργασία, για συνεργασία με το Υπουργείο, γιατί ακριβώς μπορεί οι πρωτοβουλίες αυτές να ενισχυθούν και μάλιστα αυτό να είναι και η συμμετοχή του Υπουργείου σε κάποιες περιοχές όπου θα έχει προσωπικό το οποίο θα μπορεί να αξιοποιηθεί από το Ινστιτούτο για τη Δασκαλία της Ελληνικής Γλώσσας. Τώρα, ε, όσον αφορά την πρόταση του κυρίου Αγαπάκη για το κομμάτι το εθελοντικό στο e-learning, είναι πολύ πολύ ενδιαφέρουσα και νομίζω ότι ε, θα τη δούμε. Ευχαριστώ. Θα είναι πολύ σύγχρονο. Θα μπορούσε κανείς τα διάφορα μοντέλα διδασκαλίας της ελληνικής, για να μην είναι στην ελληνική, το ίδιο ισχύει και για άλλες γλώσσες, να τα χωρίσει σε δύο μεγάλες κατηγορίες. Στα μοντέλα εκείνα τα οποία είναι ενταγμένα στο εκπαιδευτικό σύστημα της χώρας διαμονής. Και σε εκείνα τα οποία δεν είναι ενταγμένα, είναι εκτός συστήματος. Τα πετυχημένα μοντέλα σε όλο τον κόσμο, και έχω πλήρη γνώση και έχω πολλά σχολεία επισκεφτεί, είναι τα ενταγμένα. Ό,τι δεν είναι ενταγμένο, κατά κανόνα δεν πετυχαίνει. Και ενταγμένο σημαίνει ότι και υποστηρίζεται, έτσι, οικονομικά, αλλά και αν δεν υποστηρίζεται κανονικά, εποπτεύεται και λογοδοτεί η διεύθυνση του σχολείου. Λογοδοτεί. Και ενταγμένο σημαίνει επίση από την άλλη πλευρά ότι η πολιτεία, το κράτος που δέχεται να το εντάξει σε όποια μορφή, έχει ευθύνη απέναντι στους γονιούς, έχει ευθύνη απέναντι στα παιδιά, έχει ευθύνη απέναντι στον εαυτό της. Άρα είναι διπλή διασφάλιση. Και κλείνω με αυτό. Εγώ ήθελα να αναφερθώ σε αυτό που είπατε, αλλά με κάλυψη ενημένη ο προηγούμενος ομιλητής. Αυτό που αναφερθήκατε ότι τα παιδιά δεν έχουν κίνητρα να πάνε σε τέτοιου είδου σχολεία. Λοιπόν, πρέπει πια εμείς οι ίδιοι να δούμε λίγο τα πράγματα αλλιώ στην εποχή της κρίσης. Το κίνητρο δεν είναι τα παιδιά μας να μάθουν ελληνικά για να πάνε στο ελληνικό πανεπιστήμιο. Το κίνητρο που πρέπει να δώσουμε εμείς τα παιδιά μας είναι ότι πρέπει να μάθουν τα ελληνικά γιατί οι γονείς τους είναι Έλληνες, ότι πρέπει να μάθουν τα ελληνικά γιατί η γλώσσα, τους, γιατί η, γλώσσα η ελληνική είναι όμορφη γλώσσα και από, την, από τις πιο αρχές και πολύ πλούσια, γιατί είναι ωραίο να μιλάς πολλές ξένες γλώσσες. Για αυτούς τους λόγους πρέπει να μάθουν τα παιδιά ελληνικά. Δεν είναι για να τους δώσουμε ένα κίνητρο, άντε γιατί θα μπει αύριο με 10% ποσόστοση στο ελληνικό πανεπιστήμιο. Πρέπει να δούμε τη ζωή αλλιώς. Και να το δούμε τη ζωή αλλιώς σημαίνει σε όλες τις εκφάσεις της και πρώτα απ' όλα σε αυτό που λέμε στα παιδιά μας. Να κάνουν αυτό που αγαπούν. Και όχι να τους δίνουμε πάντα το καροτάκι ότι από αυτό θα βγάλεις λεφτά. Μερικά πράγματα. 1776, οι Ηνωμένες Πολιτείες παίρνουν την ανεξαρτησία τους από την Αγγλία. Γίνεται μια ψηφοφορία εάν η ομιλούσα γλώσσα θα συνεχίσει να είναι αγγλικά ή ελληνικά. Χάσαμε με ένα ψήφο. Φανταστείτε οι Ηνωμένες Πολιτείες να μιλούσαν ελληνικά σήμερα. Στο λεξιλόγιο το αγγλικό υπάρχουν περισσότερο από 6.000 λέξεις οι οποίες είναι ελληνικές. Ξεχάσαμε να μιλήσουμε για την Εκκλησία. Το ρόλο της Εκκλησίας και τι παίζει η Εκκλησία στην εκμάθηση των ελληνικών και στη συνέχεια του ελληνικού πολιτισμού και το ελληνικό είναι στους 7 ή 10.000 απόδημους. Παντρευόμαστε στην Εκκλησία. Οι βαφτίσεις στην Εκκλησία. Μιλάμε για 10 εκατομμύρια ανθρώπους που η ζωή τους revolves, όπως λέμε εγγλέζικα, με τα... Με τα ε, με τα, 
μεταστρέφεται γύρω από, τη, περιστρέφεται γύρω από την ελληνική εκκλησία. Σε κάποιο σχετικό σημείο θα πρέπει να, να, να ζητήσουμε και την εκκλησία να την, να, να την φέρουμε μέσα σε αυτή την ομιλία, να δούμε πώς οι παπάδες και πώς οι, 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 οι γυναίκες των οι, οι παπαδιές θα μάθουν οι... Uh, θα μπορέσουν να μάθουν τα παιδιά τα ελληνικά. Και τελευταία είναι το εξής, ότι μιλάμε να στέλνουμε Έλληνες δάσκαλους από την Ελλάδα στο εξωτερικό. Δεν δουλεύει, είναι μεγάλη αποτυχία και αυτό το οποίο κάνουμε τους στέλνουμε, τους πληρώνουμε και κάθονται σε μερικά γραφεία και γράφουν μερικές ομιλίες και σπανίως αυτοί οι ανθρώποι βγαίνουν έξω να διδάξουν. Μπορεί σε άλλα μέρη να το κάνουν, στον Καναδά όμως, με συγχωρείτε, δεν γίνεται κάτι τέτοιο. Υπάρχουν τρει εκπαιδευτικοί σύμβουλοι στο Τωρόντο, νομίζω. Και εκτό από έναν ή ε, δύο που κάνουν λίγο μερικέ. Ε, γράφουν μερικά βιβλία, οι άλλοι βαράνε αέρα. Λοιπόν, καιρό είναι τα παιδιά μα τα οποία έχουν μάθει τη γλώσσα, τα παιδιά μα τα οποία είναι δάσκαλοι, να πηγαίνουν στην Ελλάδα, να εκπαιδεύονται και να τα στέλνουμε πίσω. Γιατί εκεί όχι μοναχά θα μπορούν να συνεχίσουν και να μαθαίνουν την ελληνική γλώσσα, αλλά εκεί μένουν, δεν χρειάζεται να πάρουν μετάθεση, δεν χρειάζεται να πληρώνονται εκτός έδρας. Λοιπόν, φανταστείτε, δηλαδή, ας μιλήσω για τις κόρες μου. Να πάνε στην Ελλάδα να μάθουν ελληνικά, να δάσουν ελληνικά και να επιστρέψουν στο Τωρόντο να διδάσκουν. Ξέρετε πόσους Έλληνες δασκάλους έχουμε στο, στον Καναδά? Το λάει στο χίλια άτομα. Όχι μόνο Χαέλληνε, αλλά και principals και έχουμε και board trustees και οτιδήποτε άλλο. Γι' αυτό αυτού του ανθρώπου το Ινστιτούτο νομίζω ότι θα πρέπει να κοιτάξει να του πάρει στην Ελλάδα ένα χρονικό διάστημα, να του εκπαιδεύσει, να του δώσει το απολυτήριο και μετά να του στείλει ξανά πίσω. Αυτοί οι άνθρωποι για τα υπόλοιπα 30-40 χρόνια που θα διδάσκουν θα βρίσκονται εκεί. Κλείνοντα αυτά, σα λέω το εξή: Ότι την Εκκλησία δεν πρέπει να την, αγνοή, να την αγνοήσουμε, γιατί η Εκκλησία έχει λεφτά. Δεν υπάρχει καμιά Εκκλησία που να μην έχει λεφτά. Λοιπόν, η ΕΡΤΑ θέλει να, κάνει, να πάρει τηλε, να, το, την επισκοπή το και είμαι σίγουρος ότι τα, τα λεφτά θα βρεθούν. Λοιπόν, και κλείνω. Να είστε καλά. Ευχαριστώ. Λοιπόν, ε, ένα μεγάλο ευχαριστώ σε όλους για τις ιδέες σας, για το υψηλό επίπεδο πάνελ εδώ πέρα. Πιστεύω ότι θα συνεχίσουμε δου, την δουλειά, την εργασία αυτή. Ένα πάρα πολύ μεγάλο ευχαριστώ στην Τανάτη Κυριακάκη στο γραφείο μου και στην Άρτεμις Τσομίδου. Για την οποία θέλω να σας πω, είναι σπάνια να βρεις κάποιον ο οποίος μιλάει ελληνικά και γερμανικά ή την άλλη γλώσσα στο ίδιο επίπεδο. Αυτή το κάνει. Είπα ε, κακά λόγια για αυτή προηγουμένως, τώρα πρέπει να σας πω, είναι θεά, είναι θεά. Ευχαριστώ.